Okay, so welcome back everyone. Our next session is actually going to be uh, a discussion led by the FreeBSD, well, a subset of folks from the FreeBSD core team. I believe George is going to start us off, but we also have um, several other folks from core available. So I'm going to turn it over to George and then y'all can take it from here, however y'all want to run this slot. Thanks, John. Uh, in true 2021 form, can you hear me now? Uh, looks like my microphone is active. Yes, I can hear you. Can anybody hear Excellent. me? <laughs> we can hear you, Warner. Right. Yeah, actually, we can test if we can hear Warner if we go ding him on IRC. <laughs> ding, no, no. ding, ding. Yep, Warner's mic's working. Okay. So, um, great. Hi, uh, welcome to the core session for the developer summit. This is definitely the weirdest core session I've ever done. And I've done a lot of core sessions and core sessions tend to be weird. But I've never had to do one from my house. Um, so uh, a few of us from the core team are gonna talk about a few things uh, relevant to the, whole, to the project as a whole and to core generally. Um, but first I wanted to do the following. So, um, I don't know if you've noticed this, but uh, 2020 and 2021 were probably the most stressful years for most people who work on the project. And uh, we can tell this through various means. In particular, uh, Core gets to see this because we get to see people who are complaining about each other to Core, which I will not go into in depth, but I can tell you that the number of people who are a bit frazzled is fairly high. So with that in mind, here is, my first, here is our first slide. Uh, we're gonna just take a moment to chill, which means I would like everyone for the next, I was going to do this for five minutes, but I thought you all, might all kill me at the next in-person uh, uh, meeting. But uh, for the following minute, minute, I would like everyone to simply stare at their screen, not type, and breathe. And I'm going to time that on my little timer here. So everyone breathe in. Hold your breath. Breathe out. Breathe in again and breathe out. Let's do that for about a minute so that we're all nice and relaxed when we talk about the project. All right, so that's a whole minute of being relaxed. Um, let's go back to our regularly scheduled program. Um, so Warner, uh, your next two slides are up next. So let's go through the two things you wanted to add into this. Um, sure, I don't know if my video is gonna show up or not, but otherwise we can watch George. You're on mute. What? Can you- You're not on mute, I can't hear you. I'm not on mute. Can you I hear can me? Hear it's fine. Yeah, we can hear you okay. Warner. All right, so there were two updates I wanted to give about some of the work that I have in progress. One of them is um, SPDX uh, licensing update. One of the things that's been frequently requested is um, to have detached licenses. And I'm working on a policy to do that. Specifically, a detached license has a copyright and an SPDX license identifier uh, expression and nothing more. Um, and there's a couple of other ancillary um, standards. So I'm trying to write up a policy that pulls them in so that we're as compatible as we can be by doing nothing, um, <laughs> but um, we'll be uh, compatible. Um, you know, there might be a couple of small changes we need to make. This will also make it clear um, when you find a file with one of these um, changes, you know, what the license is and so forth. So expect uh, some more information about that. Um, I'm almost ready to hand off the policy to the lawyers. 
Um, if there's anybody else that would like to participate and can do so productively um, in this process, I would like you to, to invite you to call me or email me or catch me on Slack or IRC or Discord or Twitter or I don't know what else. Anyway, next slide. Next slide, George. So the next slide is about um, upstreaming uh, the QEMU uh, BSD user. Um, a number of people have been working on this. Uh, most recently, Kyle and myself, we took over from Sean Bruno, who took over from a long list of people. And th this is something that we um, use um, <clears throat> this is something that we use um, uh, quite extensively in the uh, in our um, package building system. So um, it's upstreaming. This is a status. It'll probably take about six months um, before we get everything upstream. And um, I just wanted to let people know that that was what's going on. We had a log jam for a number of years on this. And um, Kyle and I have just, just been doing that. Anyway, one thing too, BSD2 clause free BSD tag is not what you think it is. So that's going to probably be a bit of a surprise that comes out of the SPDX stuff. I just saw a comment on IRC. Um, anyway. Um, on to the next slide. I'm going to say, tell George to take over um, so that he can start uh, talking to the rest of the slides. Okay, now I can hear you, Warner. Okay, so take you. over for me. Can you okay. hear me now? Now I can hear you. Now it's your turn. I, uh, <laughs> just <I'm>... in time. <laughs> Perfect. So someone should send me a ding, like just mention my name somewhere so that I know that I'm being mentioned. Um, okay. I, uh, I just dinged you on IRC, so. There you go. Um, so, uh, <laughs> great. Uh, God. Anyway, um, so one of the things we, uh, we core went and did was we asked a bunch of the hats and teams um, to talk about what they've been doing, and in particular, to try and get people to talk about what they need. Um, our greatest need will always be hands and attention on the project. Um, we need people to work on various parts of the code, but also on various things that support uh, FreeBSD as an operating system that is shipped to people and consumed by people all over the world. So um, we talked to you know RE and Cluster Atom and security uh, documentation. So I'm gonna run through some slides from each of those teams, which try to talk about some of the stuff that they've done, some of which people may know, some, people, some of which people may not know, um, and to flag wave and get people to possibly volunteer to help these teams work on the project. Um, I wanted to say a word, or we wanted to say a word about hats and teams. Um, we know that a hat is a generic term for the leader of a team. Uh, also known as the person who didn't say no quickly enough when we tried to give them a hat. Uh, many, many hats are kind of forced upon people's heads. Um, teams in FreeBSD are work as affinity groups, right? So teams set their own charters within bounds. Um, I don't know that we've ever bounded someone's charter, but um, can't be completely open-ended. Um, important to note that the team chooses its own members, right? So, you know, um, just because you volunteer work on a, a team doesn't mean that that team is going to want to work with you. Um, hopefully they do, but teams are self-selecting and they're allowed to do that. Um, Core's role in dealing with hats and teams is to bless those in whatever way you want to think of that, um, but generally tries to avoid interfering in the inner works of the actual teams. Um, all we're interested in from the core point of view is that you know, the various hats and the various teams are able to work uh, to achieve their goals and to work with the rest of the project to achieve the overall goal of building an excellent operating system. 
So release engineering, uh, when asked what could people be doing and what could people be working on uh, with RE, um, a lot of the stuff was actually requests for things that people could do while not on the project. In particular, more testing. Um, release engineering team would really like people doing a lot more dog fooding, uh, a lot more uh, testing of things like weekly development snapshots if, if and when you can, um, especially beta NRC builds because those are right before we're about to do a release. Um, don't wait till the last minute to request a change on a release, on a release engineering branch because that's going to uh, reduce the likelihood that your change will make it in. And of course, please don't break Pola. So beware of, you know, KBI and ABI changes on stable branches because the last thing we want to do is surprise people who are consuming a stable branch. One of the things that uh, one of the hallmarks of the quality of FreeBSD is that we have a very strong commitment to KBI and ABI stability uh, within a stable branch. So cluster administration is actually looking for a couple of people to step up and actually work within the cluster atom, uh, team. They ask that people have proven system and skills and that people have done systems administration in uh, you know, large heterogeneous environments. Uh, you know, the fact that I can sysadmin my laptop and the server that you may or may not be able to see behind me does not make me a crack sysadmin. It just makes me a sysadmin of my own crack um, work. So um, need to be able to work with the group. Uh, so if people want to try and work with cluster administration and help them, you know, maintain our infrastructure, which is how we actually produce you know, our product, uh, you should get a hold of them uh, on their mailing list. They do ask that uh, we don't <laughs> we don't chuck uh, experimental hardware at them. Turns out that things like Thunder X and Early Power uh, needed so many changes that having them in a cluster where secure access was extremely important made it difficult. And those kinds of systems, they ask us to put those into test uh, clusters, which actually I'll talk about at the very end of this. Uh, and I think the last line can be interpreted in a GNN way as clean up after yourself. We're all adults, clean your room. Um, you know, please do not just leave things you've built around on the shared infrastructure that we all need to use. SEC team. So um, the SEC team, the security officer team, that's the group that is responsible for doing things like security advisories and errata notices, um, produces the FreeBSD update binary uh, builds. Um, when reporting issues, they ask that um, people use the forms that have been made for this. There, it turns out there are already three templates. They're here. Um, I'll share these slides with John so they can be put somewhere publicly later on. Um, when reporting routine security issues, i.e. please do not put a zero day directly in Bugzilla because that, that's not very helpful to us, that's bad. Um, but when you do put routine security issues, uh, put them under product security in Bugzilla, uh, which limits visibility. And as you see, for particularly sensitive issues, you know, you found a zero day in FreeBSD, um, send a PGP encrypted email to the security officer. The key's in the talk repo. Uh, Satosan, are you on the documentation one? Uh, yes. Yes. So, okay, please talk about this. Uh, let, let me explain the updates about the documentation. Um, so on documentation front, we change it a lot about the tooling, uh, especially uh, a migration to the Git report uh, along with the other uh, two repository and the migration from the XML uh, markup to the ASCII doc now and the translation team now use the WebLite web-based UI. Um, the, uh, these uh, tools are now available for uh, new uh, writers of the um, exciting documentation. So uh, one of the good reputation of the FreeBSD is uh, documentation, such as the handbook and the uh, ports developers has the ports handbook. Uh, we have uh, good materials, but we still need uh, good writers of uh, new documentation, especially um, we do not, uh, we do not 
do a good job to collecting the questions uh, floating around the mailing list or you'll see in the public forums. Uh, so people can encounter the error message, uh, the uh, resolution of the um, uh, answer can be found uh, on the official website, uh, the Google search. But uh, so decreasing the number of users compared to the Linux. So we are losing the such information visible for the newcomers. So uh, please help about the uh, writing documents. And uh, uh, we designed the official website and uh, uh, importing the existing uh, good documents on the other side, like uh, this slide shows the freebsdwiki.net. This uh, site has a good set of documentation, but uh, our main internet is no longer actively uh, working on that. So uh, this information, if we can accept as the official documentation, we want to do. So yes, uh, one thing we want to focus on after migration and tooling is uh, to write uh, more documents, uh, as well as uh, a, a lot of core, good code for the base system. Okay, that's all. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> hmm. I wonder if anyone can guess who submitted this slide. Uh, so it turns out nobody, <laughs> the project hates chickens more than the when. Um, because you know, the closer you are to the knives, the more you get cut. Um, um, yeah, I, I actually typed this slide in from uh, Lee Wynn's uh, um, material that he provided me. <laughs> OK. Um, so uh, in, the, in the CI system, we now have supported branches and architectures with builds and tests. Um, the tests are, you can, find, you can find them under user tests, thanks to Traz. Uh, there are new test jobs coming for TCP test suite and GCC nine. Um, and uh, the one asks that people follow the VCS migration to track source and doc changes with, with Git, because now all of the CI stuff is obviously going from our Git repos, um, you know, except for, I believe we're still doing stable 12 from SVN. Kubes asks for some help um, on uh, improving our SEO. So one of the things, and actually uh, Seth Sano alluded to this as earlier as well, is um, people being able to find things out about FreeBSD. And of course, the, <clears throat> you know, other than DuckDuckGo, the place where people go to look for answers to questions, um, you know, is usually Google, which is going to point them at something. And so uh, the project needs to improve its uh, search engine optimization so that users and other you know, users of FreeBSD can find answers more quickly and easily, and they show up at the top of the search results. Um, you can email Kubes to help out with that. OK, and then this is the, the nearly last slide. So um, for those who don't know, which I think would be surprisingly few, um, for over a decade, I've helped to maintain a network test lab, um, which is hosted by some very kind people up at Centex in Canada, uh, Mike Tan Tanksa and Paul Holes, who I spelled his name incorrect. I had an E at the end. Um, Mike's the CEO. Uh, they use FreeBSD. He's been incredibly generous and helpful um, with helping us to host a test lab full of very expensive, um, high-performance networking equipment. So. Um, I'm looking for one or two uh, shepherds, as I like to call them, um, to help reduce the bus factor, because if I get hit by a bus, it would be very bad, um, at least for the network test lab. For me, it would solve a lot of problems. Um, so what are the responsibilities? It's actually fairly simple. So most of the, I mean, all of the day-to-day -day work, the hands-on work is done by Mike and Paul. Um, they're extremely responsive to email. They're occasionally on IRC. I keep trying to get them to come to a BSD event in person so I can shower them with beer. Um, and so, you know, day-to-day -day operations are mostly handled by them. Um, there is a bit of outbound, um, like uh, as the monks do, going with a begging bowl. So um, the reason we have all of the hardware in that test lab is because 
uh, we've asked for it. So when Chelsea makes a new card or Mellanox makes a new card or Solar Flowner makes a new card or someone makes a new switch, um, you know, when we needed a hundred gig switch, I asked Mellanox for one and they strangely said yes. Um, so it's keeping track of who's doing what new devices that FreeBSD should operate on and trying to get those people to send us hardware, um, usually two cards, uh, so that we can do things like back-to-back -back testing. And there's a little bit of internal work. We actually control the accounts on the build server. Uh, nothing is controlled by Cluster Atom because that way we can not pollute the uh, general FreeBSD namespace. Also, it allows us to have outside collaborators. So there are people who've worked on the network, worked within the network Tesla um, who are not FreeBSD committers. They don't have a commitment and therefore they don't have a FreeBSD.org email. So that's been easier. Uh, and then a bit of periodic ma maintenance on the main build server, Zoo. Um, it'd be really nice to add some automation to the lab, but that's something that I haven't done. Um, it's complicated as everything is in networking. But if someone has an interest in trying to at least automate the reservation system, which is currently go edit the wiki and make sure you don't step on other people's toes, um, that would be super helpful. And if you want to help out with the network test lab, just email me at gnn at freebsd.org or wherever else. Um, and so that is the end of the slides. So let's go back to everyone else. Stop share. And we have what, 12, how long do we have left? 12 minutes? So I don't see any questions in the Q&A, but if people want to ask questions of CORE generally, they should do that. Looking at the schedule, George, I think we actually have uh, 40 minutes or so. Is that right, John? Yes, it is. I don't, I don't, I don't want 40 minutes of questions. No. OK, so we have quite a, quite a bit of time for questions. So if people have questions, they should, um, I guess, put them into the Q&A. Yeah, we can also watch on like YouTube or Slack and Discord and whatnot for what folks say. We do have a few other um, sessions for core related things uh, throughout the summit, uh, including some discussion of potential workflow improvements. And I think we don't we don't really want to start covering that um, now. Uh, although, if folks have any specific questions, I suppose they can uh, they can bring them up or if there's anything they'd like to prime for for that discussion. I'm just looking at the YouTube to see if there's questions over there. Um, so I'll ask a question. Hopefully it's not too redundant with what you talked about earlier. Um, you have a year left in your current term. Do y'all have like a top three to do list of things, issues you want to work on, um, during the remainder of your current term? I think that's a, uh, a good question. Um, John, I think, uh, it's probably a good point. Um, if nothing else, yeah, to, to, look at what we what this core team set out to do at the beginning of um, its uh, tenure and um, what we hope we can still accomplish during the um, uh, the rest of uh, of the term um, I don't know if anyone else wants to start off first oh no you picked it up it's your baby now <laughs> so I mean, for reference, I will say last core team, we had a couple of times where we kind of had to do that and evaluate mm -hmm. what our priorities were because our, our to-do list kept growing, but it was about, uh, we have so many, you know, so much time and resources we can devote. So what were the things we really wanted to do and we'll just punt on the other things because we can only get so much time. Right, and I think uh, one of the main 
topics that was handed uh, or the main tasks that was handed off to this current core team from the previous core team uh, was the Git uh, transition. And that certainly took longer and perhaps more effort than we um, we'd expected. Um, we thought maybe that it would um, it would it would be complete in the early part of this course team, this core team's tenure, as opposed to about halfway through um, or uh, a little before halfway through. Less than halfway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but still, I mean, I think um, that was probably the main um, technical aspect we this core had a mandate to take on and and has been wrapped up now um, through efforts of both core members and uh, in particular Lee Wen uh, putting a lot of effort into to picking up the pieces on that. I think that's that's the main thing we we wanted to accomplish. Um, and I think there are a bunch of workflow improvements that we still hope to um, to get out of the the Git transition or be able to build upon the Git transition. Um, and those are, you know, we're discussing those uh, later on in this summit, um, some ideas and uh, yeah, things we're hoping to do. I have, a, I have a whole presentation on that. I would state the goal more succinctly. I hope that we as a community, not just developers, not just users, but as a community, we can find a way and a uh, framework to move forward on integrating a lot of the promise that Git has for reducing friction in our process, for making us more efficient, to, uh, as well as um, helping us to grow community by being more responsive because we can be more efficient. And there are tooling issues and there are people issues with both of these. We've had a 20 year long track record of not landing patches. That's not gonna be fixed by a tool, but a tool can help fix that. Um, but if we don't fix our process, we're not going to fix that. And that's a large part of what my talk is going to be about tomorrow. So that's, that's the one thing. It's not that we're going to have it solved because we're never going to have our workflow solved. We're always going to need to be re revising and refining and figuring out what to do next. Um, and if we don't have a framework for talking about that and talking about that productively, we're going to continue to flounder. And that's one of the things I learned from the Git transition was that we need to have a good framework for doing things. People need to be productive and we need oversight for when they're not. Um, not because you know we want to scold them and they're bad, but we need to get things rolling again or we need to hand off to other people or whatnot. We need to build redundancy into some of the key aspects of the core of the um, project. And we lack that redundancy now. So that's, that's kind of what I'm hoping to um, set up um, in the future. I just have, thank you, Wendy. Um, Where's do, my watch? <laughs> well, say, did I you order one in coffee. advance? What's going on here? Did you order one in advance? I ordered one in advance. So, um, so the other thing um, that I'm hoping to get done is what we talked about a little bit earlier is I want to get the SPDX stuff that's a very bounded, simple thing. It's just gonna be a policy um, that we've got vetted through some legal folk and that um, anybody who is looking at a file will know what that means. And that's really from a legal perspective, um, all you need. It doesn't have to have all the T I's crossed and T's dotted because the law isn't code. And um, that's been the biggest thing I learned from looking at the SPDX stuff. Um, to answer one of the questions that was on IRC earlier about that, SPDX has kind of a fuzzy match. So we're never gonna have an exact thing, but the fuzziness is okay because all the fuzzy things that match the same thing are legally the same thing in terms of um, you know what your obligations are, your rights are, and what you would litigate against. Um, so, and that opinion has been validated by a large number of lawyers uh, in the real world, uh, so. That's the other thing I'm hoping to accomplish um, in this term. Um, so that's it. I mean, the first goal is pretty big and ambitious, and I'll need everybody's help. And the second goal is more manageable. And if you know, there's a couple of people that can help me on that, that'd be great. And if not, I'll still get it done. Is that the song?
Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. I um I have a, a slightly different ideas uh, from the other core members because the my um uh, ideas when I run for the core team. So I am uh, probably a um a core team member who has a long history on the uh, um, uh, terms as a past terms and the current terms. But I only think the core must be um, um, encouraging the uh, um, uh, com developer community uh, rather than the actively uh, working on the uh, leadership work. So the part of the term is the, the core is small and the current term is uh, more actively working on the, uh, for example, the get, get um, transition from the uh, subversion or uh, something like that. So I think um, the current core team is uh, doing a good, good job and uh, I, uh, I'm i happy with uh, working with the current core members. But the, another thing uh, we do not, we should not forget is um, uh, we should uh, maintain the uh, people already working on the various teams in the uh, previous project, the if they have uh, trouble, um, the uh, if the the mm, teams or other uh, sections or inside the previous project, uh, that's uh, what we have to uh, maintain. And uh, more people, uh, we have to put the more active people inside the structured. Um, work inside the uh, project because we are um, a volunteer based work. So uh, we love a lot of active people, but uh, uh, one of the important tasks for the core team is organize them and encourage them. So yes, uh, the taking a leadership is a one. Uh, I am not good at uh, speaking out the uh, a lot of things to the uh, people, but uh, yes, I am uh, seeing the people and the uh, where uh, where the problem uh, is uh, for a long time, and uh, I want to spend the time to uh, oversee the uh, such kind of problem as a, a member of the coach team member. So yeah, that's the uh, current view of the uh, coach team and. Uh, one of the uh, tasks is uh, the current team, current core team uh, should consider, and uh, I can uh, help. Aware, oh, yeah, I can help. So I'll go. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I mean, I was going to say that I wanted to get to the end of the next year and just survive, but I guess that's probably a little too dark. Um, you know, the the things that I uh, came on core to do are things that I am still, you know, they're not things that will get done in two years. So um, I really want to see us as a project um, do more to uh, make FreeBSD usable as a toolkit for building more things. Um, we've done that pretty well, and that's why a lot of uh, vendors have picked up FreeBSD and built things with it. I mean, NetApp and Isilon and Juniper and many people have, have used it to build products. Um, you know, a, a monolithic Unix-like operating system with a 40-something year history, if we go all the way back to BSD, is an interesting artifact. But is it the right artifact, you know, going forwards? Like, how do we make it so that our software can wind up being part of systems that are now called IoT, which used to just be called embedded systems, but since everything needs a tag phrase, now it's called IoT. Um, so figuring out how to how to you know work, how the project can improve the architecture of the system overall, not just package base, but various other things that will make it easier to pick and choose and build systems out of it. That's important. Um, <clears throat> I will continue to flag wave for things like CI and testing, in particular network testing. Uh, this is something we've talked about endlessly and things have definitely gotten better. CI has gotten better. Our automated, automated tests have gotten better. Um, we have a TCP test suite that 
various people have worked on it, including Michael Tuxin, that kind of work needs to be promoted and continued um, because, you know, we want to put out the best code we possibly can, and we can't do that if we're not testing our code effectively. So those are the things I intend to work on over the next year. It's a short list. It should be done within nine months. <clears throat> okay. So we have a question from Alan Jude, which I'll read and I'll let you guys respond. It's, it's great to not be on court. Um, what can we do to improve the quality of the release notes? And then and, and I can, I'll, I'll finish this question, then I'll comment. They're currently mostly a semi-automated big list of changes, but they often don't include a highlight section of big ticket items, like why this release is important. Um, <clears throat> But we also need something a bit more like updating, things to watch out for while upgrading, like the p-state thing breaking power D, which I didn't know that broke power D, the VLAN type issue, and various other hiccups upgrading for folks who are upgrading to 13.0. So that's Alan's question. Um, I will comment a bit. I actually helped a bit with trying to work on our release notes for 13, and it is definitely a slog. I found it much helpful when people would put things into the rel notes file that we added this time around than trying to troll commit logs, but it does, it also seems that like uh, the sense of the right level of detail, like I think at times we have too much detail about small things in our release notes and then admit entire bullet points about actual big changes. So that's my kind of little bit of thoughts, but I'm going to turn it over to you guys. What do y'all yeah. think about improving the quality of the release notes? Yeah, we, 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 do need, we do need to move away from the bullet point. VM rewrote the system and, you know, where it needs uh, more explanation. I mean, I, yeah, I created the rel notes file specifically to try and help with that. Cause I, whenever trying to find, uh, like whenever I was trying to help with release notes in, in the past, uh, it, it was a slog exactly as John said. Um, rel notes has kind of worked, I think, um, but also kind of failed in the sense that like the, there's a few people who are good at updating it um, and a lot of people uh, don't and, and, and I mean that I'm, I'm sure that's just an omission. Um, I, I ultimately think that's the sort of thing that kind of has to be curated by a couple of people or at least a small group of people with kind of similar uh, sensibilities regarding like what level of detail goes into release notes. Um, just based on the fact that you know, like I, I can't see any solution other than to have a, a checklist item. Every time you push a commit, oh, is this release notes worthy? And we already have that in the template, right? Um, I don't know what else we can do to have developers um, proactively do that that kind of work. Yeah, I think Mark. One thing that's interesting to me is um, with respect to the addition of of rel notes. Uh, I think it it definitely has worked out well in in certain cases um i think we don't have a lot of consistency necessarily um with what we've told how, how we've told developers to treat it um and like you mentioned we we have the the rel notes yes or no tag in the um uh, in the commit template and uh it, it's i mean putting rel notes yes in a commit template is a very different uh, action than adding a, an entry into the rel notes file itself. Um, and I think, yeah, we could we could sort of try and formalize that a little bit more. And um, it, it may well, perhaps, perhaps uh, rel notes as a file as opposed to um, uh, the commit tag is a better approach. Um, really, we ought to be writing the release notes for FreeBSD 14 right now. Right. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of what I had in mind with this notion of curated, right? Like, you yeah. know, if, if it was, if it was, say, a weekly task for someone to go through that week's commit logs and try to identify something noteworthy and reach out to the uh, developers making those changes to see if they can get some clarity or whatever, um, then, yeah, we'd, we'd save a whole bunch of sadness at the end of the release cycle. Um, I was actually wondering, Mark, I mean, I know you've been doing some of this, but maybe one of the things we should do is try and recruit someone from the doc team to work with release or whoever, someone who can, who you know, many people who are source committers can write, but um, 
someone who really can turn something into narrative so it's not the bullet points um, and can do the highlight thing. It might be good to try and get those two teams to talk to each other or get get Greg on the foundation to do some of it, but that seems like a it would be a huge task for someone to do as a, a job. It'd probably be better if we could get someone from the doc team to do it. Or, or several someones or have a, you know, a best practice that, you know, when you commit a feature, you know, to send things off or to have somebody on the doc team going, hey, that looks like a feature. Can you send me a photo <laughs> of that? Or, you know, yeah. something, I think, I think you're right, George, that it needs, there needs to be some oversight, but um, it needs to go both ways. You know, someone who, you know, who the developers know to contact, hey, I got this thing, here's my crappy English, can you turn it into like something people would want to read? And on the other hand, you know, that's also active and cognizant enough in the community to go, hey, this needs release notes. Or maybe we have some developers watching that and send this person ideas so they can coordinate it or I don't know. But, you know, something that um, encourages people to talk to each other um, and uh, rather than um, like we've been doing, putting it all off to the last minute. You know, well, it's part the, of your thing. It's part the, of your thing, thing about really, documentation. Yep. Yeah. You know? The thing I really want to, um, uh, the thing I really want to emphasize though is it needs to be someone who can do a bit of narrative, right? What our current updating or rel notes usually miss are a narrative, right? And if we, figure out a way to do this right if it's someone from doc or you know someone from source or someone from source and doc or whatever if we figure out a, the right structure not only do we get better release notes which are more useful to the community at large but we also get you know the biannual article for the freebsd journal of what's new in x it's a lot easier to do that if the release notes are more of a narrative form than a set of bullet points well I so there's several things I think. I think Mark's right about timeliness. <clears throat> it is a lot easier to talk about the changes you've made uh, usefully right when you've made them as opposed to two years later. Uh, so I think timeliness is good. And I think that just to be explicit, um, you write release notes as a different audience than a commit long. It is part of why the rel notes yes is kind of a fail and why having a separate file as Mark has done is useful you write something different in a release notes than you write in a commit log. In a commit log, you say, well, I fixed this foobar because this was broken and under this race condition, this happened or yada yada, or this implements this new version of this protocol. And the release notes is something like, oh, well now the Beehive VNC works with the screen, capture, the screen share thing in Mac OS. That's what the user cares about. They don't care about that meant supporting XYZ compression with VNC protocol 2.7 or so like what, like the details we put in the commit log are not the same thing as what matters to the user that you want to write into release notes. Like the release notes need to be more abstract and they have to be targeted at like, it's just a different layer. And that's part of why, like, I know I try to write stuff into rel notes that is more targeted at that level of topic, not the topic of what you put in the commit log, which seems to be different because the commit log is helpful for doing code archeology span in the future when you're doing and blame or annotate want to know why this doesn't check this condition this way. And it, there's just different audiences. And so the rel notes yes thing means that whoever is curating the rel notes has to then go back, look at the commit log and try to reverse engineer. Well, what in the heck does this mean to a user to try to figure like that, that's one of the problems I ran into when trying to work on some of the 13.0 release notes was looking at some of the detailed stuff and seeing if I could reframe them and collapse them into kind of more succinct descriptions that were interesting to users, not to developers. So I, I really like the idea of curating it like once a week or once a month, but it, I do think it's important that, to have this notion of who the different audience is and writing to that audience. And just explicit that it can't be the same text. It needs to be different text. So, I mean, even hints in the commit logs can help if you at least are hinting why some change matters to users, not just why it matters to the flow of the code. Sorry, I'm so boxing. Um, no, you're, you're absolutely right. We, there were Donnie, you're running for core next year? Yeah, there were, there were several <laughs> comments on, on Dev Summit that um, you know, were talking about why uh, um, you know, what you were saying was good. Yes, I even got dinged.
So we have another question. I'm not sure if, so this is from Nick Wolf. I think it's along the same lines. He said that he would say that reviews need more statement of what their impact is supposed to be, not just what is technically being done, which I think is probably mind what I was asking about. I mean, effectively what people want is not just what, but why, right? I'm I mean, gonna go check the, see if there's any more we need to talk about for this topic. Okay. But I mean, the bullet points thing is what, what changed? This file changed, this bug was fixed. But, you know, for a larger, for an actual feature, you want to explain why, why did we add this? Why did we change the VM system? Why did we, you know, integrate something new into the network stack? Or, you know, what, what is the purpose of this thing? Is it adherence to an ex external standard? You know, in the case of a lot of networking stuff, we do things for adherence to external standards. Is it to provide you know, I mean, the, the hardware access is the most obvious one. Oh, we added a device driver for this new chip, right? Well, without that code, then you don't have the device driver for the chip. The chip doesn't work, have a nice day. Um, but I, I think a lot of people are very used to saying what they did and are and fewer people are used to saying why it's there. Or as, as someone I worked with used to always do in their commits, their commit message was two words. It was bug fixed. I was very happy when we got rid of that person. You know, the, the, the suggestion they're amplifying on um, in the uh, um, on IRC, it was basically that we start thinking about release notes as part of the review process. So we, we move it back a step from, oh, I just committed a bunch of changes. Maybe I better update rel notes to um, have it be earlier in the process, if that's going to be a change, it's going to be something user visible. And so that gets people thinking about things earlier. And we invite, you know, we have it more integrated into our process, if I'm understanding um, dark fibers comments correctly. Yeah, and Warner, I think that's a really good point. Um, I think uh, one of the things we should try to promote is taking a more holistic um, view of new feature development. And so when we have a, um, uh, I guess, as opposed to sort of, you know, sometimes release notes will mention bug fixes or new drivers or something like that. And that's, that's a different kind of, of category. But in the specific case of, you know, some significant new functionality that's being developed, um, in addition to writing or thinking about the release notes uh, at the time that we're developing that feature, we should be also making sure that um, the tests are updated, that the documentation for that feature exists, whether that's the handbook, the man page, whatever it is, right? And a lot of times we've had, um, oh, some code lands, and then later on some documentation, you know, man page update lands, and then later on maybe maybe the handbook gets a chapter added or something. Um, and it's not necessarily the case that the same person has to do all of that work or that, you know, the feature, um, uh, is going to be rejected out of hand until that's all done but sort of as a, a development community we should say these are the things that we want to happen as part of this feature development and let's figure out how to make sure that they all happen um, as this feature gets uh, comes to completion well do we want to maybe do something like discourage the use of rel notes yes and encourage people to add rel notes entries i mean i think from my perspective, it's a lot easier to take an existing real notes entry and kind of adjust the language for style. Um, Cause I did the style passes this last time, but like to take the idea and play with the wording is a lot easier than to still have to do the thing of re-intuit, like reverse engineer what's meaningful from commit logs. I mean, that, having I think the thing- so far, we, we really, I mean, I had a series earlier, like a few months ago where effectively I had a rel notes tag, but we decided a rel notes diff, but I dropped it in favor of using the tag instead. But do we want to maybe change our policy and encourage the other way around? I think we want both um, because the tag is easy. So, you know, it's if we can at least get people to say, hey, this probably requires rel notes, that means someone can post process and be like, oh, Bob said this requires, you know, rel notes. Let's go ask Bob or Alice or whoever. Um, if we make it such that the, the barrier to entry is higher where they actually have to write a rel notes entry. I think fewer people will do it. So I think, you know, it would be great to encourage people to write a paragraph, um, but there also ought to be just a tick box so that, you know, people who 
are overwhelmingly terrified of writing prose can be like, here, this thing probably requires some real notes, which means send, you know, that, that tag means send me an email to ask me. Yeah, the, that gets but back a little bit. My experience in 13 was I looked at the real notes file and I didn't bother doing the git grep to try to find all the commit logs because it would have been too much. I think, I think John, by the time you're sitting down to write the release notes and doing the git grep, it's too late. Um, which yeah. is what you've said earlier that we need to do it earlier, and that I think if we put rel notes equal yes, I think that you know the folks on the doc team that are handling the release notes should contact people to um, you know get the text and they should add it to the rel notes file whether we can continue to have that in head or we merge you know that stuff and um, you know what the folks are writing somewhere else as long as it's well known where things should land, um, I think that's a good thing. Um, but I don't think that real notes, yes, is going to be sufficient. We're going to need some other things around it. To, if, if the project really wants to have better release notes, we're going to need somebody or some bodies looking at this and doing the work. Okay, I think I think that horse might have gone on to its reward. Um, well, I don't see any other questions. I actually want to look and make sure first. So we've got about almost 15 minutes, well, like 12 or 13 minutes. So I'll give you maybe one more. Um, I'll give you an open-ended question, which is, what are some things that you see? Um, you know, I'll figure out how you all want to answer this. Um, what are some kind of coming things that you may see that are relevant to FreeBSD's future in the next three to five years? Like, are there trends? Are there things that we're not, are there, like, are there things we're not addressing that we need to address that we need to be watching out for, like changes in technology or so forth, um, or, or cultural changes or other things? Um, are there other kinds of Big picture, where do you think FreeBSD needs to go? Are there markets we're missing? You know, what, however you want to play with the ball, what do you see about a little bit more future beyond just the next two years, but more of the three to five year range? One of the things that we'll see in that time frame, I, I can think of a lot of things, and this one's just one of the technical ones. Um, our storage system has been, our storage stack is built primarily on the assumption that. IO is expensive, and if we do a little bit of extra processing um, on the way down, nobody's going to notice. Um, as the number of IOPS gets higher and we move to things like NVDIMs and non-traditional storage, um, that poses two problems. One is all of a sudden these assumptions aren't true anymore, so that little bit of extra locking, that's eh, going to hurt you a lot. Um, as well as, um, you know, is the block paradigm um, do for replacement. Is there's going to be you know some key value pair paradigm that gets standardized that we need to support, or you know something like that. In in some ways, it's kind of you know file systems beyond beyond POSIX that people talk about every so often, and nothing ever seems to catch on. But th those are sort of the things that we need to be on the lookout for uh, from a technical perspective. So that's the one thing that came to my mind. Um, there's a number of things we need to do socially, but that's my talk tomorrow, so. Um, so I also will talk about technological things because why not? Um, <clears throat> so there's a few things. One is uh, Intel is dead. And so Intel will not be the main place where our code runs in three to five years because we'll see how, we'll see how things play out. But at the moment, they are not the interesting architecture ARM is. Um, we're already well placed on ARM, but we have to remain there and we have to remain competitive on ARM. Um, being on ARM as opposed to being on Intel, which was not just Intel, but basically, you know, 20 years or 30 years of Windows plus Intel forcing servers and desktops and laptops into a particular format. Um, that doesn't exist in the ARM world. So we need to be able to address things like SOCs and different ISAs that are within ARM, if you think of things like the M1 chip, which is not exactly in ARM64, 
it's an ARM64 that's been, you know, dosed by Apple. Um, and then, you know, risk five, right? So we're well placed in a lot of these things currently because we have people who've worked on them and people who continue to work on them. But it's those are now the expanding markets. You know, every so many years, um, the industry branches out into a bunch of new architectures. Some of them live, some of them die. Intel has had a very good run. Um, we will see if they can they can rebound. Um, but <clears throat> the way we support architectures is probably going to have to change over the next three to five years as you wind up running on systems that really are not going to look like each other in the way that Intel-based Windows-based systems look like each other when we started. Um, that's one thing. The other is security. Um, you know, we're again well placed because we've got Robert Watson and a ton of people at Cambridge working on Cherry, which is a very advanced way of dealing with the fact that C programming is awful um, and C code is awful, and we're going to keep running C for a long time. So, you know, those kinds of changes we're well placed to pick up because a lot of that research is being done by people we know and who know and love FreeBSD. But that um, that kind of technology is going to continue to uh, become more relevant. Uh, it's pretty much the case that at the moment, um, security, computer security is so awful uh, that something is going to have to change. And if we're lucky, it'll all go in the cherry direction because we're already there. Um, if we're not lucky, there will be other changes we're going to have to adapt to. I think those are the two big areas for the next three to five years for, for any operating system, not just for BSD. Anybody else in core want to take a stab? Um, okay, so I, I will oh. go ahead. Uh, so uh, I love to see the uh, FreeBSD um, uh, for the next five years. Uh, so I love to see the flexibility of the uh, usage of the FreeBSD. I mean, the, flexi the word flexibility is the uh, for example, the reusability of the subsystem and uh, in the another system, for example. So uh, FreeBSD is a complete OS, and we have uh, we are proud of the uh, we are shipping the complete OS. But uh, 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 there are a lot of other systems in the market, and the FreeBSD can be fit uh, into the uh, small part of the other system. So our network stack is reused. Uh, extensively uh, in various places, but uh, if we pick up the a single functionality from the FreeBSD and use it in uh, on another system, for example, the Linux or Windows, it is difficult to build them, and uh, uh, there is uh, some difficulty to maintain it. So, uh, for example, the um, so network stack is already uh, used as a user land library. Uh, so previously, network stack is used in such a way, but uh, we do not support um, the FreeBSD development ecosystem. So if we put this uh, more flexibility to the such a subsystem. Uh, along with the uh, normal development of the um, FreeBSD as a single OS, uh, we will find a um, uh, new, new market to make the FreeBSD as a, a useful OS. It, it's a difficult to overcome the other big OSs in the market, but uh, 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 improving, so uh, put the effort to make our uh, FreeBSD uh, distribution as a toolkit will be an interesting target for the next four or five years, I think. Okay, Mark, did you want to go to, I think? Yeah, I was going to say something uh, fairly related to what uh, Sato-san did. Um, it seems like, at least looking at Linux, there's a trend towards uh, um, changing the way the traditional IO path works in 
kind of monolithic operating systems where you have to do a system call to do each unit of IO. Mm. So IO Uring is very popular in Linux these days. It's also very common to have user space, um, user space implementations, uh, network stacks and storage stacks and so on. And that's, that's not a new trend obviously, but it's, it's one that doesn't seem to be going away. Um, aside from performance, uh, it's, it's attractive, I think, to vendors because it makes the implementation a lot more malleable. You don't have to wait for your kernel to be updated with whatever bug fix to the TCP stack. Um, you, can, you can iterate a lot more rapidly. Um, so, I mean, FreeBSD does have some technology around these lines, but uh, uh, you know, there, there, there's a few different places. We have NetMap, we have you know, a fairly robust AIO implementation. We have, um, there's, there's an interface in CAM, I can't remember what it's called offhand, where you can kind of asynchronously queue CCPs uh, to a disk. Um, so we, we have a lot of pieces of, of those, we, we have a lot of pieces that you can leverage to, to address um, the, the kinds of problems that I think a lot of larger enterprise users are interested in solving. Um, but it doesn't feel particularly cohesive. And, and uh, I think we're going to have to spend some time catching up to uh, uh, at least where, where Linux is going in terms of the momentum. Yeah, the IO ring example is a particularly good one, um, Mark. It's one the one of the other things in the storage stack that we need to you know adjust to. That not everything's going to come in as a block request. Um, so that's that's a very good point. And I mean the 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 way, like solutions. There's there's a lot of architectures where you can. I, I I'm looking for a reason to bring up uh, you know. Kind of any kernels or rump kernels where you you kind of link parts of the kernel into your application um, instead of uh, uh, making effectively RPCs into the kernel. Um, I've, I've wondered a lot lately about whether uh, it would it would benefit FreeBSD to to adopt uh, adopt some of the technologies, the at least the ones that have originated in NetBSD with respect to uh, rump kernels. But I mean, I I don't have enough expertise to to really say. It's more just uh, something to think about. Okay, um, not really a question, but uh, I'll just note it and see if any of you would like to offer some feedback. Um, uh, Vince from Discord <clears throat> noted that big dot little CPUs are going to be the norm at every scale very soon, and that our scheduler needs to be aware of this and support big dot little. Um, so, do you, are you guys aware of anybody working on big dot little support or where that state might be? So I think the short answer is um, that uh, there's nobody um, actively uh, actively working on it uh, at the moment. Um, it, it it is the case that the the big big dot little kind of concept is um, uh, originated in the ARM world, but yeah, it's, it's going to appear um, appear el elsewhere. Um, and I suspect that what will will happen is that as part of the um, the sort of FreeBSD Foundation's funded efforts on uh, FreeBSD on ARM, that'll be a, a task that needs to, to slot in um, in that uh, in that domain. That, that's my my likely guess. I don't know if anyone else on Quark has has thoughts. I think that'll be part of it, Ed. Um, but I th also think that um, it's more than oh, we need some special case code that the CPU can handle a lot. Certainly, and yes. A little. You know, there needs to be uh, some thought given to other considerations, like um, I'll use more power if I schedule it this way versus that way, or um, you know, something I'll use more cores or something. It's more of a you know, the, we need to be more dynamic and take more things into account than we have in the past while still um, maintaining a reasonable level of complexity and predictability, um, you know, in our systems, particularly when these additional features aren't enabled, so. So one other thing on big, little and power, by the way, like electricity, 
um, a bunch of us, or some of us have at least talked to Robin at ARM, who's who did a lot of the framework that he tried to get into Linux, Linux refused it. Uh, we've looked at that stuff with Robin on and off over the years. And I think, you know, that's something where we really need to go and talk to him and maybe some other people who worked on this stuff for other kernels. Um, and see if there are, if not code, ideas that could be integrated into our system. Um, because, you know, those chips sit in very low power devices and, and definitely are always big little, or often big little. Okay, well, I'm going to check. We're actually at the end of our slot. We have a little bit of time before our, our next thing for the our last thing for the day, but I'm going to give a few minutes to see if we get any more questions that come in. Um, um, I would say that we could probably spend a good 20, 30 minutes talking about power management. So I'm not going to open that can of worms right now, but there's a lot more to power management than just um, in, in CPU scheduling is part of it, but there's there's a lot more down that rat hole. So I'm not even going to open it. But I'm going to look around for a few minutes just to make sure if we have any other questions that I've missed for core. But if not, then I think um, we're going to go ahead and take this is kind of the end of our main track for the day. Uh, well, or at least a, a good chunk of our main track for the day. We're going to take a bit of an extended break for about 30 minutes or so. So folks can stretch your legs, um, maybe try to obtain a meal if it makes sense. Uh, and after that, we're going to come back for our final event of today, which is going to be st story time with Kirk McCusick. So don't run off. I mean, well, you need to go grab something to eat or something, do that, but definitely come back. Um, don't just go away forever. Uh, you'll definitely want to hear from Kirk. Um, I always enjoy when he has story time. So we'll see you all in about 30 minutes or so. And you can also welcome to hang out on uh, the hallway track while we're waiting for 30 minutes. Uh, and I guess, oh, okay. So when Kirk is going to talk, he's actually going to pick from the three different sections of early BSD kind of history that he can talk about. And so there's actually a poll here if you're on the Zoom webinar where you can vote for which of these you would find interesting. Uh, the three options are the early BSD history, uh, the TCP IP wars, or about the USL UC Berkeley lawsuit. So we'll leave that pulled up for now for during 30 minutes so y'all can vote on the webinar and we'll use that to decide which part Kirk will talk about when we get back. Uh, we'll see you all in about 30 minutes. So thank you all for being here so far. Thanks for hosting, John. Thanks, John. Oh, sure. Thanks, John.